Hi DEF CON. So my name is Neil Sika and today I'm going to be talking about um, MET 4.0 PKI mitigation. So uh, MET is a tool from Microsoft and it's a free tool to mitigate different various attack techniques. So a little bit about me. So I'm a security engineer on MSRC, the Microsoft Security Response Center. I look at zero days that have been like in the wild or privately responsibly re reported vulnerabilities. I'm an Emmet developer. I like blogging after work and on my free time uh, about technology and security at Neil's computer blog and I'm on Twitter if you want to talk to me or something. So an overview about what I'm going to be talking about today. So first I'll be going into what Emmet is followed by new features in Emmet 4.0. Uh, the architecture of Emmet and then I'll be taking a deep dive in the PKI feature of Emmet which was our, non our first non-memory corruption mitigation and then I'll be giving a demo that hopefully works live. Okay. So first of all what is Emmet? Emmet is a tool that mitigates uh, different exploitation techniques. So it's been historically mostly for memory corruptions and uh, stopping exploits that take advantage of memory corruptions. But uh, it's ‑‑ and one thing about it is that it's not signature based. Rather it's behavior based. So for example you don't need signatures for it or anything like that because it just looks for behaviors, common shell code behaviors for example. So uh, it could stop things that people don't know about also or even uh, Microsoft doesn't know about. So for example zero days. Uh, we've actually used it to ‑‑ recommended it to, mit to mitigate uh, some advisories in the past. Uh, and because it's dynamically loaded at runtime, it's like a DLL that gets loaded into your process's address space. So it doesn't require like recompiling or redeploying your application. And so if you have like a million computers or whatever, you don't have to go and do that for all of them. Uh, and it works on all supported platforms so far. So right now it's ‑‑ XP is still supported. So as far back as XP. And it's a way of giving back to the security community and it's a free tool. So what applications does it work on? Like these are some of them. So as you can see like IE, Skype, Office, um, Chrome. It's basically uh, Microsoft and third party applications. So some changes between MF 3.0 and 4.0. Um, first of all uh, we added the certificate trust PKI mitigation. So a lot of talks this year at DEF CON have been about uh, man in the middle and like abusing PKI and stuff like that. That's ‑‑ I'm not saying that PKI itself is bad or something but I'm saying that it, sometimes it can be weakly implemented or badly implemented like if you use short keys and stuff for your roots. So that was uh, a mitigation we added for that. Uh, we added uh, a, a mitigation for ROP exploits and some hardening for those ROP mitigations and a new user interface so you can have skins and cool stuff like that. Okay. So I'm going to first go into the memory corruption mitigations that we've had. So we have the uh, basically forcing DEP on which is dead execution prevention and it's basically by calling set process DEP policy on the process that we're trying to protect with the DEP uh, protection. So this is basically so that you're not executing code on pages that are not supposed to be executable like on the heap or something like that that are supposed to be read and write. Uh, we have the heap spray mitigation which reserves not commits virtual addresses that are commonly used by heap sprays. So uh, yeah, so it's ‑‑ it reserves it calling ‑‑ using those APIs. We have the mandatory ASLR which are, does something where it reserves the preferred module loading base address so that the module cannot end up loading there. It, pre it reserves it so that there's ‑‑ it's not able to load there so it has to load somewhere else which is effectively ASLR but obviously newer techniques of ASLR on newer versions of Windows is is safer and has higher entropy and stuff. We have the null page mitigation where we basically we reserve the page zero, page address zero so that you can't abuse null pointer dereferences or null pointer bugs. The EAF mitigation which is export address table filtering. So that's basically uh, the if ‑‑ if shell code for some for example is trying to read the export address table and it that we, set, we set a hardware read breakpoint on the export address table to make sure that EIP which is an x86 instruction pointer, EIP doesn't point to like some random place like in the heap for example because that's kind of creepy. 
And uh, then we also do bottom up randomization where we randomize different data structures in the processes address space. So as I mentioned earlier, these are all memory corruption mitigations. And some more memory corruption mitigations are the CHOP mitigation, which is structured exception handler overwrite protection. This is basically where we traverse the exception registration structures, the chain of them, looking for one whose previous pointer is negative one because that's what we expect to see. And if we don't see that, then we know that something has been corrupted and that's bad. And finally, our ROP mitigation, which is new in MET 4.0. Uh, this, we have some hardenings for this. Uh, for example, deep hooks, where we protect things like virtual protect and virtual protect EX. So, like an API and an API that it would call, so you can't bypass it. We have anti detours, which is basically preventing an attacker from jumping over the detoured part of a function. So, basically, jumping over our, our hook, kind of. And ban functions, where we disallow. Uh, specifically in this in this release is uh, disallowing calling uh, NTDL's LDR hot patch routine and that's thanks to Yang Yu of NS Focus from CanSec West this year. So uh, our ROP mitigation, uh, ROP, okay so I'm basically going to try to explain ROP in like one slide so we'll see if you, if <laughs> it works. So it stands for return oriented programming and it's basically uh, uh, the shiny technique for bypassing DEP. So basically what happens is the attacker injects an attacker controlled call stack and as you all know an, a, a call stack has return pointers to where uh, the execution is supposed to return after you get out of a function. So what the attacker does is they return, they set these return pointers to a few, in, to always point to loaded modules that are valid to be executed and uh, a few instructions before a ret instruction. So you can basically chain these together and then you can try to, uh, what the hell? Okay, so yeah, so then you can basically try to achieve the, uh, the attacker's intention without actually injecting code. They're just reusing code that's already valid to be executed. And so things like virtual protect, for example, are commonly wrapped to to change uh, protection, uh, memory protection on pages. That's by, used by a lot of exploits. And stack pivot, for example, is uh, a pivotal technique inside the ROP exploits to basically switch the ESP, which is the stack pointer on x86, from where it's currently uh, pointing to, which is on a regular stack, to the attacker controlled call stack. And I have more information about this uh, in the presentation that I did at NullCon about ROP. That was in greater detail because this is just one slide like I said. Hopefully you all got what I'm talking about. Okay. So some of the ROP mitigations, uh, these are new in 4.0 from 3.0, uh, include the load library mitigation which is basically to make sure you're not loading DLLs from like network shares because that's kind of creepy. Um, the memory protection where we basically make sure you're not making stack pages executable because as you guys know stack pages are supposed to be data so read and write not execute. The color mitigation where we basically make sure that the return address where this current, this current frame's return address does points to a location that's preceded by a call address which calls this function. So that's basically so that you're not returning to this function. The sim exec flow where we make sure we don't ret to ROP gadgets after this function returns. And the stack pivot which is basically where we check the ESP x86 register to make sure that it's between uh, the stack pivot and the stack base that's identified by the TEB for our process. And my coworker Ilias did a good presentation about, uh, a deep presentation about the ROP mitigation in his uh, recon presentation from this year. Okay, so this is the architecture of Emmet. So basically, uh, we have the pr protected processes, like you, th you can see on the bottom, uh, the IE process and Acrobat and whatever else you want to protect. And you see Emmet.dll loaded into there. Those are, Emmet.dll uh, implements the memory corruption mitigations. And as you can see on IE, you see the Emmet CE on the bottom also. Uh, that's where we have the, the PKI mitigation, or a part of the PKI mitigation. And I'll go into more detail about that later. And basically all these DLLs uh, use interprocess communication to communicate with the Emmet agent which you would see running on your machine if you're running Emmet. 
And that's basically the one that Emmet Agent is the one that implements the tray icon and the logging and the PKI logic. The emmetce.dll is basically loaded into the into browsers or pr programs that use CAPI, uh, Windows CAPI APIs, crypto APIs. And oh god, okay. <laughs> What's this called? Shot, shot the noob. What's he gonna do? It's louder. There we go. Thank you. Uh, we need someone from the audience. First time DEF CON attendee. No, no, no. <laughs> there we go. Come on up. <laughs> I'm usually going for the first hand I see up, which is a good try, though. Good try. Wait, I have a question. So, do you guys like walk around to like five tracks every hour taking shots? Yeah, look at this. Yeah, so, so that's a good question. The first speaker has actually asked the question. It's like, so the speaker goons, are we doing <laughs> shots with everyone? Yes, that's exactly what we're doing. That's epic, right? Yeah, that's epic. <laughs> she got one. All right, to infosec. Right. All right. <laughs> Paul. All right, thank you. Paul, care of the dog. Good luck for the rest of the day. Yeah. Paul's having a rough morning. <laughs> catch up. Oh, you can be up here with me. This is cool. <laughs> okay, so let's get try to pick up right where I left off. Um, yeah, so. Uh, <laughs> So basically anything that uses CAPI is protected including other browsers so like Chrome or whatever could be protected by this, uh, this PKI mitigation. Okay so now I'm going to be talking the rest of the time about PKI and the new mitigation. So PKI stands for public key infrastructure which is as Wikipedia puts it basically about dealing with digital certificates. Excuse me. Did he just say at DEF CON I'm going to talk about PKI, which stands for public key infrastructure. <laughs> Evidently, we're in the advanced track. <laughs> Con I'm continue. I'm trying to make sure everybody gets my talk. So, so this is basically used to ensure confidentiality, integri integrity, and attribution online, and it's like the basis of like HTTPS and dealing with like your bank website or whatever else or other secure websites that you want to keep secure. So here's an example. This is what uh, PKI looks like. So you can see at the root, you have the root certificate, obviously. And it basically, si so every parent signs the certificates for every certificate underneath it. So for example, in this case, the root certificate would sign the intermediate certificates and the intermediate certificates would sign in turn the end certificates. So the end certificate would be like whichever site you're trying to log into over HTTPS. And it's basically a chain of trust rooted by the root. So there's have been some recent uh, TLS and SSL incidents that you all might have seen in the news and stuff. Uh, so st starting back as far as 2008 when Sadarov and Stevens proved that MD5 was harmful and their MD5 is harmful pr uh, paper. And then in 2011 we saw like three different attacks on uh, CAs. So uh, basically fraudulent certificates being issued. And then in January of this year we saw Turk Trust get compromised. So in a nutshell. PKI is under attack. I heard a yay from the audience. <laughs> so some, uh, so PKI uh, certificate pinning is basically assuring, like enforcing certain assumptions or expectations about certificates that we get from the internet. That's yeah, broad definition. And there has already been some pretty good work in this space as well. Uh, uh, Moxie, Maron Spike, and Perrin, they don't, they made TAC and convergence and a few others. Uh, but as you can see, all of these require changes to existing protocols. Uh, so for example, in the TAC case you see TLS changes, convergence has a new protocol, Dane TLS has DNS changes and uh, HSTS and what we input, what they implemented in uh, Chrome had uh, a new, had to change uh, HTTP. 
So history has told the industry again and again that requiring changes to protocols or new protocols takes forever to actually be adopted by everybody. Like look at IPv4 and IPv6 for example. Not everybody is using it all the time. So our design goals, we had three main design goals. One is to give control to users. So like you can, you can pick the exact certificate you want to pin to or not pin to. You can pick domain names and then other heuristics that I'll go into later. Another thing we wanted to do was not require changes to pre-existing or new protocols because as I mentioned that takes forever to get adopted. And finally we wanted to keep Emmet as a standalone, a standalone tool and not depend on any other services out on the internet or anything. It's like its own self-contained tool. So this required us to, imp to have, make design decisions and trade-offs that a lot of other uh, implementations couldn't make for PKI, for pinning because we had to conform with what was already out there and we had to still try to protect stuff. So our, our approach was to not require any protocol changes and we pinned to root certificates, not intermediate certificates. So there's in that, in that tree that I showed you earlier, there could be some, some certificates in the middle like the intermediate certificates. We don't, we don't check those. And we also are pinning to only certificates in the Windows trusted root certificate authorities store. That's like if you go to MMC you'll see that. And we also had to identify certificates. This was a, a, a bigger discussion in our team to figure out how to do this because uh, we were trying to figure out whether we should pin to issuer and serial number tuples or to subject key identifier. And I'm going to go into more detail about this because this was kind of a big deal, a big decision for us. So uh, as the RFC for X509 which is RFC 5280 says, the issuer name and serial number identify a unique certificate. It's pretty blatant and obvious. But that's like really rigid because if you're trying, so it's, it is a valid case that two root certificates could have the same public private key pair. So although yeah you would be identifying a unique certificate, you would still have false positives because you are identifying a certificate not a key. So we decided to also add uh, an option to pin to a public key. So in this case this would be the SPKI, sub the subject key identifier of the root certificate. And this is thanks to feedback from the community. Thank you for your feedback. And this is also from other people giving us feedback like Google and stuff. So shout out to everybody that gave us feedback. So this is what our, our architecture looks like for the PKI subsystem. Basically we have a bunch of pin sites. So in this example, I'm taking the Skype example. So we have a bunch of pin sites at the bottom. So for example, login.skype.com and secure.skype.com. And they're obviously both Skype services. So they would share the same pin rule which would be the MS Skype CA. And those services are expected, the, the expectations that we're forcing via the definition of uh, pinning are pinned to things that we expect to see like Baltimore, CyberTrust, VeriSign, GlobalSign and GTE, CyberTrust. So in general basically different services uh, under the same organization or whatever share certificates that they pin to. So uh, we implemented, so we, we implemented a crypto API CAPI extension. This is what I said was in the MHCE64. or MHCE or the MHCE64.dll. And this, this basically communicates with the Emmet agent. And so we're passing, so we're inside the process that uses CAPI and we're passing the full certificate chain. So the end certificate, all the intermediate certificates and the root certificate to the Emmet agent that I mentioned earlier. And then the Emmet agent makes a decision, decision about whether or not the certificate is okay or not. And we, as you can see on the bottom, we have the little crypto, the crypt register OID function. That's a code snippet, kind of. And you can see that we specifically target SSL over there. So this is specifically for SSL checks. So we have, here are some checks that we do on the certificates. So we basically check the end certificate and different properties of it like the subject name, the DNS name or other things in there. And we basically make sure that it matches a pinned site that, that I mentioned earlier that's configured for Emmet. And uh, 
Uh, basically, a root certificate is what I showed you earlier in the, in the, as the root of the tree and the end certificate is the, the certificate that the HTTPS server gives us. And, and then we check if the pin rule is expired or not because that expires. And either depending on the configuration of that decision that I mentioned earlier that we had to make about pinning to individual certificates or pinning to public keys of certificates, in all, in all cases root certificates, uh, we either checked if the public key is a match or the serial number and the subject name. And so here's some more, here's some what we call exceptions where we are doing heuristics on the, on the certificates. So we check the public modulus bit length which is the size of the length uh, which is basically a measure, it could be, it's a measure of this, this, the key strength. So if you have like a 512 bit key that could be considered small and you have a bigger key like, like a, a bigger key than that, that could be considered stronger. So it's like I said a measure of the, of the strength of the key. So we, we have like a minimum bound on it. Uh, so that the the user can also do can check that they can also check the the digest algorithm. So if it's like MD5, which was proven harmful in the past, they can disallow that, or they can disallow routes from certain countries if they don't like. For example, if they don't think VeriSign should be in a different country than the U.S. or something, they can check that and mark that as weird. So in general, here we're basically trying to give a lot of control to the users, so they can decide what they, what they want to and don't want to check in the certificates. That was one of the design goals. So here are some of the default protected domains that ship with Emmet. So this is in the cert trust.xml. And these are uh, th third both third party and Microsoft domains and sites. So these are basically like you can see like Twitter, Facebook, uh, Yahoo. Those are basically other companies that uh, wanted to cooperate and be in this with us. So we so shout out to them. And so this is basically various, various uh, domains that we're pinning to. And this is all in the rec in the. This can be configured by the wizard in in Emmet. So I believe it's just best to be upfront and straight up about what the limitations are and not try to hide it. So uh, some limitations are that we mitigate specifically for SSL and TLS, not other crypto protocols. We are pinning to just, we're just checking the end and the root certificates like I mentioned earlier. We're not checking the intermediate certificates. So that, that's a possible limitation. The pin configuration is statically shipped with Emmet, so we don't, it's not, it's not like in Windows Update or something where we're like pushing down new configuration or something like that. It's basically whatever comes with it is what it, what, what we have for that release. So they could be outdated if tomorrow like some company decides to change, a, change the route that they chain their certificates to. And in general like Emmet's mitigations are not 100 percent bulletproof. They're trying to raise the bar for the attackers but there's a way to get around it. So uh, yeah. So okay demo time. So uh, do you all want to see a live demo or a pre-recorded demo? Live? Raise your hand if you want to see live. <laughs> all right. We'll do it live. <laughs> Hopefully this works. <laughs> Given the DEF CON network, I don't know. Okay. I have a VM here. Please work. Unidentified. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully. No, apparently the DEF CON network is not serving us today. So, okay, I'll just show you guys a video. Yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, who's dosing the network? Okay. So, okay. I can't see this, but I think you can. Let me guys, let me. Ch yeah, it's to make your day brighter. <laughs> for Emmet or for the picture? <laughs> oh, okay.
Okay, I have no idea what's happening because I can't see the screen. Hold on, it'd probably be a better idea if I duplicate my screen. No, nothing? I heard a bunch of random yelling. I didn't really hear anything. Resolution. Awesome. Okay. Man, I really wanted to do it live, but whatever. So, okay, as you can see here, this is the configuration for Emmet. So, well, can you all see the text? Oh, man. Okay. Let me increase the resolution then. HD. Uh, smaller. Okay, cool. Can you all see that? Please? That works? Is that good? I hear a bunch of groaning. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm just going to explain what's happening. Or, okay, I'm trying to make it, change it once more to make it even smaller. 1024, 768, old school. I don't have the zoom tool. Okay, y'all can see it. Okay. Can you see that? Okay, whatever. Uh, so I'll just explain what's happening then. So basically, uh, you see uh, the configuration, and that was that MIT configuration. And now login.live.com is working, and the certificate is good, and stuff like that. So I'm going to fast forward. So the point here is that uh, we see that the certificate chains to the VeriSign root which is in the, in our trusted store. And that's the MMC that I was mentioning earlier. Okay. So now um, on this VM I was running uh, a web server where I was serving up an HTTPS page but that HTTPS page was encrypted with uh, certificates key who chained to another root in my root store but it wasn't the same VeriSign root. So this could represent like if, if you're getting man in the middle or something by, by a certificate that chains to another root in your root store like for example this year the Turk Trust, if they, if they got compromised and they're in your root store and you would chain to them and then you would trust them because the certificate chains to them and they're in your root store. So I manually added a certificate to my root store and I'm changing the hosts file here to point login.live.com to localhost, the web server. So as you can see here, you see that um, this is obviously not login.live.com. This is my IS, uh, my page. And on the, the bar on top, you don't see it red or anything and you see a little padlock there which would fool you into thinking that it's good. That's because I have a certificate with login.live.com uh, domain name listed there that chains to a root in my root store. But it's obviously not good. And it's not login.lives.com. So this is just to prove to you guys I'm not lying. Here, okay. So you see um, the the MMC that's open. Or you m see or might not be able to see. I don't know. The MMC that's open. Uh, that that is a certificate that I generated, and it was a root that I generated. So it was not correct. Okay. Now the cool part. So now when we enable the login.live.com rule. As you can see there, um, login.live.com works as expected. But when I change the, the host's file to point to my local web server and then I run IE, there, you see that little icon there? 
So Emmett detected that there was an SSL, there was a problem with the SSL certificate. So it said that, it's a basically a warning. So although IE doesn't show that the bar is red or anything, it, that certificate, no, sorry, that, uh, that icon pops up saying that there's something weird going on here. Okay, so now to switch back. Okay, yeah, so that was the demo and I guess we had to do it recorded. Sorry guys. So, um, yeah, so that's basically it. Um, some references. Uh, so you can download Emmet 4.0 here if you, if you need it or if you want it. Uh, and this is uh, a lot of good work, references to a lot of good work that I used when I was making this presentation and when we were making the design decisions for Emmet. So any questions or anything? Also, I want to say that this was a team effort, so thanks to the whole team, the whole Emmet team for making this possible. So the mic wasn't on, but the question I think I heard it was, "Can you pin a site to multiple root certificates?" Yeah, so that's what we're doing. So in that example that I gave about uh, Skype, uh, you see like the the login.skype.com I think it was. So that had multiple. It had Baltimore Cyber Trust root and the uh, GTE. And is is there a way to tie that into GPOs or otherwise push down settings to users in a corporate environment that does like? SSL decryption or would want to do that to multiple users or does that have to be done on an individual basis on individual machines to change those settings? No, Emmet supports GPOs so that's why I was saying if you have like a million computers or whatever you can set it through GPO to propagate down to everybody so that you don't have to go into it to every, every computer. Hi. I have uh, two questions. The first one is there was a recent research uh, that showed that most uh, SSL applications that are not browser based are Actually, incorrectly implementing SSL. So, and the Emmet, as far as I understand, protects a specific application. So, is it Emmet what? It protects a specific application that you predefine. Is there a way to uh, make Emmet work on all applications? On uh, uh, no. So, uh, well, are you talking? Okay, so you're talking about specifically about SSL. Yeah, be because this is a problem that would be relevant not just to browsers but uh, to other SSL applications. Yeah, so in that case, yeah, so I saw like Outlook when I was using Outlook it had um, the MSCE.dll loaded because it's looking for a CAPI. So in that case, yes, I meant no for if you have like memory corruption, like ROT mitigation or whatever, that would be like for Acrobat or for IE or something. But okay. yeah, for if you, if you want to do the crypto API, uh, if, you, if you're using crypto API in your application, then this would protect you. It loads it into anything that uses it. It's in the, it registers it, uh, the DLL. So it will be loaded to anything that uses crypto API. So that's why it works for like other browsers also, for like Chrome or, uh, or IE or um, Outlook, which is not a browser, obviously. Okay, and uh, thank you. And uh, another question is why don't you integrate uh, this notification with the regular uh, announcements or notifications about fraudulent or incorrect uh, certificates? So why is it a separate uh, notification? Separate than what? Then uh, if I had a fraudulent uh, or incorrect uh, certificate come into my browser, I would be notified in another way, right? Oh, you mean with a red bar, for example, right. on top? Yeah. So, uh, Changing, so IE is like a lot of code and it's huge and changing like the behavior of IE would be like really difficult. And so we, we, like I said, we wanted to be standalone. So we, we just wanted to display this notification just like we display all the other notifications, like the, the one that people are used to, like to see the Emmet in the, the little tray icon. We didn't want to be changing the behavior because you have to go through like a bunch of other stuff to change the behavior. No. No. 
So first, thank you for having the guts to come before this August group of users to uh, try your hand at explaining this. But the question is, is this intended to replace other certificate validation tools? Does this provide, would it be fair to say this provides a baseline of certificate validation through Windows where before previously it was an external application suite or tool set you had to use to check to see if certs are valid uh, for OCSP and other things? In other words, is this OCSP based? Is it Krill based? No, it's not. So basically uh, when you're asking about replacing other uh, tools or something, um, when you're asking about replacing other tools and stuff like that, uh, each tool has its own uh, strengths and weaknesses. So for example, our strength I think was that we didn't try to uh, change any protocols. So you can use other stuff also that might not have the same weaknesses as, as Emmet but then the, s the strengths also change. So what I'm trying to say is that it's not a replacement. It's just, it seems like there's many different uh, solutions out there right now. So this is just another one that I think that has uh, some pretty good strengths with not too bad weaknesses. Do you have plans for providing Emmet protection as an API for third parties? Mm, not that I know of yet. Why? Mm. <laughs> Well, we just released it a few months ago, and no, so Emmet has been there for two years. No, the PKI mitigation. I understand. I'm not. I'm talking about in general as an Emmet. Oh, okay. So for you talking about the memory corruption mitigations, for example, yes, about making other, other things. Yes. Yeah. So um, we, I've, I talked about that to my coworker, but I mean, we have, we're thinking about thinking about that still, but we have to f still have time to like outweigh the benefits and the costs of it. So I mean, for example, would it like break? everybody that's using it or, you know, would it break some really popularly widely used applications? So because like when you, if you, if you have a lot of users for example, you have to be very mindful about uh, not breaking them with, because sometimes they, they de rely on your software through undocumented methods and that are not according to the software contract. So you are using undocumented constructs? No, we're not. But I'm saying like we're just doing our own, our own like the, our, we're basically just like doing all of our stuff is looking at memory corruptions inside of our own DLL. So we're not using any undocumented stuff that I'm aware of. Like basically we're, so what I'm trying to say is when you change like the operating system, you got to be very mindful about who, you, who you're going to affect. I mean this is no different than uh, asking third party vendors to drive, uh, to, to write software device drivers. To write what device drivers? Device drivers. So anyone who writes device drivers altering the kernel, right? So why don't you expose these APIs for third parties? So th what I'm saying is this is not a part of the operating system right now. So like you, there's no, a I mean we can't like expose Windows APIs that do this because it's not a part of Windows. This is a separate standalone tool like I was saying. So. Um, there are many libraries you are exposing. Right. So like we, we have these DLLs loaded into processes and stuff but we haven't made the decision yet or even talked about I guess like putting it in like so that everybody can use it. So I, yeah, that, I can take that as a feedback. So I'll, ta I'll bring that up. Thank you. You said pinning rules expire. Could an attacker with local access like modify the date or something to avoid Emmet and fall back to standard PKI? So that, all of that stuff is stored in the registry. So they would have to be have registry access to, ac to access the configuration of it. Oh, and the question, sorry for, sorry for those people that can't hear. So he was saying that uh, can an attacker modify the configuration? And I was saying no, you can't because uh, that it's the configuration is stored in a privileged location. Anything else? Questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>